The ICFRC hosts community programs to address topics of international interest. Uh, we thank our members, volunteers, and interns for making these forums possible since this is baseball, and since game two, Mike Boddicker won uh, in the World Series. In what year? Mike Boddicker, a pitcher who grew up just and went to high school in Norway, Iowa. Uh, 1983, he pitched for Baltimore Orioles, who went on to beat the Phillies in five games. So a little trivia there for you. <clears throat> I want to acknowledge our university and community sponsors, University of Iowa International Programs, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, University of Iowa Center for Public Policy, and the Stanley UI Foundation support organization for their financial support. And also today's special sponsors, Midwest One Bank, Taxes Plus, and Hazel Zeba. Also, thank you to City Channel 4 for professionally recording our programs for Cablecast on City Channel 4 or 118-2 and the UI Library's digital archives. Over 200 ICFRC podcasts are now available and can be found on iTunes. And at this time, it is my honor to uh, introduce Josh Schomberger. Josh has served as a president and CAO of the Iowa City Coralville Area Convention and Visitors Bureaus for the past 17 years. In this capacity, he oversees the destination, marketing, and community betterment efforts of the greater Iowa City Coralville area. He's been recognized twice by the Upper Midwest CVB or Association for Bureau in Innovation, recognized every year since 2004 by the Corridor Business Journal as one of the 20 most influential corridor leaders, and by the Iowa City Press Citizen as a 2001 uh, to 2010 Person of the Decade. Josh grew up in Cuba and Puerto Rico, big baseball fan, uh, Florida and San Diego, and has lived here since October of 1996. Iowa City in Coralville, as you've seen, uh, has become a hub of international sporting events. Josh will provide some background for the success. So please, uh, let's welcome Josh Schomberger. Thank you, Sue. Uh, and I can attest Sue knows her baseball. I enjoyed our conversation here. I'm a huge baseball fan. It's uh, my number one most favorite sport. And Mike Boddicker, I have a funny story. I was living in Puerto Rico at the time watching the World Series when the Orioles were in it. And I knew he was from Iowa, so I my grandparents are from Cedar Rapids, and I, uh, I watched the whole thing. And then I came back for a visit, and my aunt showed me where Mike Boddicker's uh, in-law's house was. So we drove over there, and Mike Boddicker's car happened to be there that he won for being the World Series MVP or for some award. And so I made her stop, and I went up there and knocked on the door and said, is Mike Boddicker here? And uh, he said, well, you're looking at him. <laughs> I said, oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to thank you for an autograph you sent me. And he, he said, who are you here with? I said, my aunt, but she's scared to get out of the car. <laughs> so <clears throat> I'm, uh, I know Mike, Mike Boddicker well, number 52. So I uh, appreciate the opportunity to visit with you a little bit here today. And I'll make sure that I stay on time with everything. I was asked by Ed and, and the, the folks to talk a little bit about some of the events that we brought into town. And so I'm happy to do that. I, I apologize, the screen's not the best uh, for the slides that I put together, so I'll have to uh, maybe talk you through what a couple of them are if you can't see them. Uh, this first image is a little funny, and I really enjoy it, and I, I think it speaks to what we've been able to do here, particularly in the sport of wrestling and cycling. Uh, this is four of our Japanese wrestlers who discovered uh, the ice cream cones at Carver Hawkeye Arena. And they tweeted in... Uh, of course, Japanese, uh, that it was the best ice cream we ever had, uh, according to what tr the translator said. And so uh, this was all over Japan with these four athletes talking about the, uh, the cones in, in Carver Hawkeye Arena. So the CVB has been organized uh, since about 1983. It's the Convention and Visitors Bureau. It's largely funded uh, through lodging tax collections. So unless you stay in a hotel room, if you're in trouble with your spouse or something like that, you don't contribute to our organization. We're largely funded by hotel motel tax collections. And that's the way CVBs are funded around the, around the country. There's about 26 or 28 or so in the state of Iowa. And we're one of the largest here in Iowa City, Coralville. Lodging tax accounts for about $4 million a year in collections in Iowa City and Coralville, with the majority of it 
happening in Coralville, but Iowa City is is rising up the ranks with the additional hotels that are happening. So we have a budget of about uh, $1.5 million. Uh, 53% of that is lodging tax. We have some funding from partnerships, and then we do a lot of program and special events that create some revenue. Uh, we're governed by a board of directors. We're a standalone nonprofit organization, and that board of directors is uh, represented by several elected officials, Mayor Throgmorton from Iowa City, uh, several elected officials in Coralville, North Liberty, and Johnson County. Visiting and tourism is big business in Johnson County. Last year, uh, over $399 million was spent in Johnson County uh, by visitors. And our definition of a visitor is somebody that spent money here that doesn't have a zip code that's in Johnson County. Uh, and so that's the amount of uh, the economic impact that we're seeing from people that, that don't live here uh, that spend money on goods and services. It accounts for about $26 million in local and state taxes, so for funding. And as I mentioned, a little over $4 million in lodging tax. For every dollar of lodging tax that we received, uh, through our conferences and sporting events, uh, we track the economic impact of those by getting data from the hotels as to how many room pickups they had, what the rates were. And we can, uh, sta we can state and show uh, uh, to a dollar that for every dollar that was invested in the CVB, we brought $11.72 back uh, to the community uh, from visitors. <clears throat> so just quickly, I'm going to touch on a couple of the state regional events that you've heard of uh, here in town, and you may not have associated with us or what we do, uh, but we've been very involved in a number of things, particularly in the last almost 18 years that I've been here. Uh, you're familiar with Herky Arm Parade. Uh, we created that event originally in 2004, and at that point I said I would never do it again. <laughs> but 10 years later, you know, I had a new staff and everybody wanted to do Herky Arm Parade, and everybody loved Herky Arm Parade. I just was really tired of moving fiberglass herkies around and then trying to protect them from nighttime activities. And uh, But it's, it's a terrific event that has raised a lot of money both times. We give the money to the charities, and, and uh, people just love Herky. Uh, you can't see the image on the right up there, but we took the Herkies in 2004 to Big Ten Media Day to kind of show this off. No university had done something like this before. We were the first in the in the country. It actually started with Chicago in 98 with Calzarn Parade. And then I was in Cedar Rapids before this for about four years, and I did overalls all over an American Gothic happening. And then right when I came down here, we started talking about Herky. So I put those on the street, or I had our team put them on the street. And I remember this little girl who lived there in Chicago came by and wanted to know what we were doing with all these chickens. <laughs> <laughs> said, obviously, you're not a Hawkeye fan. So uh, it's, it's been a great event. <clears throat> uh, Fry Fest, we organized Fry Fest. We just celebrated the 10th anniversary. I think you're all familiar with that. We really only intended to do that as a one-year celebration because the city of Corva wanted to rename First Ave Hayden Fry Way. We had a lot of celebrations around it, and then that year, 20,000 people showed up. So we decided, you know, let's do it every year. It turns a non-home Big Ten home game into a conference-like game and brings the legion of Hawkeye fans here 24 hours earlier because everybody is excited and everybody thinks we're going 12-0 this year. So we've been able to capture that enthusiasm and turn it into a, a big event that impacts really the whole community from a hotel standpoint. Uh, we uh, were very involved in securing the designation with the Writers' Workshop, I'm sorry, the International Writing Program for the UNESCO City of Literature, and uh, have, I was the board president for the first couple of years of that, and that uh, materialized into a lot of events, including One Book, Two Book, Children's Literary Festival. Uh, John Kenyon is their director. He does a terrific job. Uh, I hired him when I was the president of the board at that time, and I'm really proud of how that has continued to grow. Uh, Burr Fest is a big celebration in Coralville that happens at the end of January. It's a big winter brew fest uh, that uh, raises a lot of money for some Coralville charities, and uh, that's that's a, a big activity that uh, will will be coming back in in January. Uh, anytime Ragbri's come to town, we've been one of the chief organizers of that. Most recently, obviously, with the city of Iowa City, but also with Coralville. Uh, for at least five times, uh, Iowa City. This past year, it was the second time they've been to Iowa City. Uh, in the 70, no, I'm sorry, in the 46 year history. And I think Ragbri will be back in four years uh, for Coralville because uh, we've gotten to know the director really well and he's kind of promised us that Coralville will get Ragbri 50, uh, which, which will be a big year. So we'll see if, the, if he holds true on that. Uh, last year we created a marathon. It was the first ever one in the corridor. It was a really big deal. It's something that people have been asking me 
uh, because they see our organization getting things going and doing things to do for 10 or 15 years. And last year, we finally figured out a way to pull it off. There's really only one way you can uh, have a marathon between Cedar Rapids and Iowa City. Uh, we named it Run Crandick, which many of you probably remember, know the Crandick Railway, and maybe may, some of you even rode it uh, in the in the 50s. Uh, I've heard a lot of great stories about how fun that train was when people were heading back from Iowa City to Cedar Rapids. Uh, but uh, Run Crandick, uh, you know, the only way you can get there is 965. So we figured out a way to work with the county and shut down uh, Highway 965, a full lane, for about four hours uh, last April to uh, – to make this happen, and it was a huge success. We, um, you can't see this really well, but those are dots across the United States. <clears throat> we had uh, runners that registered and came here from uh, 32 states and three different countries uh, that came and ran in the inaugural marathon, and we just announced it'll happen again at the end of April. With all of these events, I go into events trying to figure out how we're gonna do it, and then can we do it, and we don't really take on an event unless we know and we're reasonably confident that we're going to be cash flow in this. Um, and in this particular event, we set up the performer to, to break even, maybe make $10,000. Uh, all the money we had identified early would go to the schools. And in this one year event, uh, we raised uh, over $56,000 uh, that we gave to the two school districts. So it was a really big deal and, and a big success. So uh, on some of the national international events <clears throat> that we've been getting into, uh, we, we were fortunate enough to really go pretty hard and convince USA Wrestling, which is part of the United States Olympic Committee, uh, that there shouldn't be any other place that should host the Olympic trials and determine the team that we're going to send to the Olympics every four years than Iowa City. Iowa City truly is the capital of this nation and the capital of this continent for wrestling. Uh, there's, there's no question about that. I know maybe some Iowa State folks would like to disagree, but that's just not the case. Uh, we have 8,000, 9,000 season ticket holders, which is more than double, probably the, the closest competitor. And so in 2010, we started a campaign to convince them to bring it here. Uh, before the Olympic trials, uh, all the years before that, uh, they had attracted just about 5,000. I think the record was 5,500 uh, attendants in a crowd for an Olympic trials. That was set in Dallas in 2000 or 2004. Uh, we uh, not only secured the Olympic trials for 2012, uh, but we shattered all records. We had 16,000 at every session and a three-day total of 54,000 people. So they didn't even go out to bid. The second time through, the first time through, we had to bid. We were competing as finalists against Columbus, Ohio, and we were competing against uh, Omaha. Uh, f when we flew out, we took a private plane out to Colorado Springs and had to do a two-hour presentation to convince them. Uh, the, the best decision I ever made was to make sure that Dan Gable and Tom Brands were on that plane. And I knew that when we walked in that room that if they were going to tell Dan Gable or Tom Brands if somebody was going to have to be told no, they're going to have to go tell them no. Uh, Columbus went before us. I kind of saw their presentation, so I immediately made some notes about why that's not going to work uh, for Columbus, Ohio. Uh, I found out they had a car dealership that had already, as part of their bid. There's all these sort of things you want to kind of one-up your competitors. They found a local car dealer that had already agreed to pre-purchase 8,000 tickets. And so uh, that's pretty impressive. That's a tall order. Uh, so I made sure, and and when we um, got in there and we started giving our presentation, I made sure that we'll we'll also uh, now that we'll have a, at least eight thousand. We'll have sixteen thousand people, and there'll actually be people in the seats. They just won't be tickets sold. So um, we uh, we were fortunate. We received that bid. Uh, the Olympic trials was a very very big deal that year. We. Uh, uh, had it, he, wrestlers here of men and women. You know, some people don't realize there's a women's freestyle wrestling team that started in 2000, and they are really good. Uh, they're currently probably number two or three in the world. Uh, I've been checking my phone uh, regularly today because uh, about four months ago, the Hawkeye Wrestling Club, which is the club that supports uh, men's and women's athletes to pursue world and Olympic golds, added four women to the club. Uh, which is remarkable, and one of our women wrestlers just missed out on a bronze uh, about an hour ago uh, uh, against uh, a wrestler from Azerbaijan. So um, women's wrestling was it was a really, really big deal there. That's Adeline Gray, who's a three-time world champion and will probably be a four-time world champion here at about 1.30 today uh, when she wrestles for gold uh, against, I think, a Turkish wrestler. 
Um, so uh, we were successful in 2012, and we were also successful in 2016. As I mentioned, they did not go back out to bid. Uh, they knew that there wasn't anywhere else in the world that's going to sell out the stadium and create an environment to where we're chanting red, white, and blue. Uh, and obviously, we support our, our wrestlers, and when our wrestlers on the mat, we're cheering for that person to try and make the team. But all in all, we are kind of one family, and that's that's been pretty special uh, in that setting. Uh, this is a pretty interesting picture on the left, if you can see it. I know the slide's a little rough here, but <clears throat> we actually were – you know, everything has to be thought of when you welcome all of these uh, wrestlers to town. And it was even more so in the next couple slides when I talk about the international level. But uh, we had one of our sponsors that put a wrestling mat in baggage claim at the airport. And they had wrestlers when the wrestlers were coming in. If you, while you were waiting for your bags, if you wanted to go takedowns with one of the, one of the wrestlers, they'd sit there and go takedowns with you. So it's a pretty interesting thing. And, you know, obviously if you're just at the airport and you're looking, you're like, what the heck are these people doing here? So, uh, brought a lot of attention and, uh, we closed down some streets and, uh, it was, it was a, a really big deal. That, that photo on the right is one of my favorite. That's, uh, uh, the opening round of our women's, uh, division, um, or session. And so there's, a uh, four uh, or eight women on the mat trying to make their way to, to be on the Olympic team. So that created an opportunity for us to go to another level, an international level. Um, the Olympic trials obviously is the best. We're, we're creating the best wrestling team in the United States has to offer. And then that wrestling team goes to the Olympics. And so we follow them. And, and you know, our, our website was Iowa City to London and then Iowa City to Rio. And it may be Iowa City to Tokyo, but we actually may take a, a session off. Uh, we'll see how that continues on over the next couple of years. But that's what we're doing. We're sending the best team uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the Olympics. And so uh, UWW, uh, which is the international governing body for the sport of wrestling, that stands for United World Wrestling, uh, used to be wrapped under FILA. And then FILA got in a lot of trouble. And FILA is, uh, is a questionable organization at in some settings. And so they, uh, they switched over to UWW and a new, new sort of bot governing body. And we started working with UWW and, uh, USA wrestling called and said, Hey, um, we've had this world cup in the United States a few times. It's, uh, it's been in Los Angeles. It's been in Las Vegas. Uh, the, the world cup is the top eight wrestling nations in the world as determined by the most recent world championships or the most recent Olympics. So even though wrestling is an individual sport, we send a team of eight or a team of 10, and then they accumulate points. And at the end of the day, just like what happened yesterday, uh, we took the silver medal as a nation to Russia, who took the gold medal uh, by maybe a dozen points. Uh, and so those, the top eight nations are invited every year to battle in a dual tournament. So your country versus our country. And they separate them into four, two pools of four, and then you have to win your pool, and then you battle, you wrestle for the gold medal. And so it had been in Los Angeles. It had been in Las Vegas. Uh, a lot of the UWW countries love to go to those cities because of the, the fun they can have in Las Vegas. Uh, but when we were at the World Championships, and this is kind of what set it off in 2015, the World Championships, which are right now going on in Budapest, Hungary, um, they, there was uh, an interview on the mat and I was sitting up in the stands watching this and somebody, uh, one of the announcers came and interviewed the, one of the coaches for the country of Turkey and said, well, what do you, how, how has it been? What do you think? And he's talking about, oh, we're doing okay. And they're like, well, what do you think of Las Vegas? I mean, has it been fun? And he goes, yeah, Las Vegas is great. And he said this in like broken English, but he goes, but if the United States truly wants to host a world championships, it should be in Iowa. And I was like, oh, my, right on. Did anybody get that on camera? <laughs> so immediately we started like kind of thinking internationally in 2015. And I talked to the head of USA Wrestling and those guys who that's part of my job is to build those relationships so they don't think of another city. They know that if they announce another city that they've got to call and talk to me and I'll, I'll ask tough questions. But that's part of what I'm supposed to do. So we st they said, hey, what about Iowa? Uh, in order to host the World Cup, they had annually had to write a half a million dollar check to pay the bill because it's an it's expensive venture. It's it's about a seven eight hundred thousand uh, dollar budget or or event to put on. But in Iowa, we don't have to worry about that because in Iowa we sell tickets. In Los Angeles, they don't sell tickets. 
there's like 2,000 people that show up at the World Cup. Here, there's 8,000. There's 10,000 people that show up at a World Cup. So we have a different sort of um, performa than um, than a Los Angeles. So we looked at it, and, and uh, we talked to Tom and everybody and said, you know, what do you think? I mean, you want to have Team USA here for two weeks? Uh, training in your room in the in the in the Mar- last week of March in April, and do we want to welcome these top eight wrestling nations? And and we ended up pursuing a bid, and it was very quickly accepted uh, because everybody around the world knows Iowa, and everybody around the world, all of these wrestlers, uh, want to wrestle in front of big crowds. And you know, um, this uh, um, Sajulaya from Russia or Yazdani from Iran. These are some of the greatest wrestlers in the world. They've never wrestled in front of more than four or 5,000 people. So to walk into that arena, and I remember taking them one by one when they arrived to the, to, for their first practice and walking them into an empty Carver Hawkeye arena. And they're looking at it and they're looking at me like I'm nuts. Like, why are we in this big venue? And then I start pointing to the Hawkeye banners and then I show them some photos and they're just amazed. They're snapping photos that they're wrestling in such an incredible venue. So uh, we, we truly had an, uh, an opportunity to go and get this, and, and we were fortunate to do so. Uh, wrestling, as I mentioned, I mean, obviously, is, is we're known around the world just as, as much as we are for our writing as our wrestling greatness, our writing history here. Uh, but but it's, it's, a, it's a beloved sport uh, in, in some of these countries. I mean, it's the national sport of Iran. It's, it's arguably the national sport of Russia. This photo on the left here was taken at the World Cup in 2017, so one year before us. And you can't really see it. I can show it to you later if you want to come up. But those are a bunch of Iranians outside the arena that are getting selfies with our Thomas Gilman from the Hawkeye wrestling team because they knew who Thomas Gilman was. And they were waiting for Jordan Burroughs to come out. And they were waiting for Kyle Snyder and David Taylor to come out because they know and they appreciate great wrestlers. I mean, they love Jordan Burroughs arguably more than most of the United, the Americans love Jordan Burroughs. They think he is a god over there, this, uh, this wrestler that was, is from Nebraska and, and wrestled at Nebraska. Same in Russia. I mean, they still talk about Gable, although they, they, they call him Gobble uh, in, uh, in Russia, but the Russians know Dan Gable, obviously. Everybody in the world knows Dan Gable. And so it's, it's, it's a really big deal, and, and it op- was a great opportunity. So as we went through the process, um, we start. We were awarded the bid in August. All the countries uh, were notified that they were in the top eight in about October. And then as we got closer and closer, we had to get visas and travel arrangements for all of these countries and these delegations. And the delegations ranged from about 17 or 18 to, I think Japan brought 54 people. Uh, Kazakhstan, uh, no, I'm sorry, Azerbaijan probably brought 45 to 50 people. Uh, in their delegation. Well, as we got closer and closer, we were waiting on Russia and Iran. And Russia and Iran, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's any question that neither of them wanted to come wrestle and, and get beat here by the United States team because it was the first time we had 10 weights at a World Cup and we would have beat them. Uh, there's no question about that. And they were waiting and waiting and, oh, we're getting visa appointments. And Iran was a unique situation because they... Um, it had a pretty big falling out because of the previous world championships. Their coach quit because Iran uh, would not allow their athletes to wrestle an Israeli. And so they quit and didn't wrestle matches and had to forfeit. So here's an Iranian athlete who is wanting to achieve greatness for his family, for everything, to win a gold medal at the world championships. And because of the way the brackets worked, he has to face an Israeli in the next round. He forfeits the match because um, his country did not want him wrestling an Israeli. Uh, the Iranian would have, would have beat the Israeli very quickly because this, uh, these, these Iranians in these weight classes are, are the, truly the best in the world, but it doesn't matter. So he had to forfeit a match, and his coach wasn't getting support, so basically all the coaches quit. And within about two months before our World Cup, Iran had no like wrestling federation. And so there wasn't really anybody organizing. They went over to Dubai and ended up getting visas uh, to be able to come here. But at the end of the day, it didn't work out. And they ended up pulling their federation back together. But they had all sorts of problems with how that was being worked out. And it's still a problem to this day. 
The Russians, on the other side, were a completely uh, different story. Uh, the Russians basically didn't decide to go in and try and get visa appointments in the consulate in Moscow until uh, about four weeks before the World Cup. And that's just not the way it works. You've known for eight months that you're coming to Iowa City to wrestle in the World Cup, and you just decide within a few weeks before the World Cup that you need to go get your appointments. And so they were blaming they couldn't get appointments, and they were blaming uh, this, this tension that's happening uh, with our two countries at the moment. And that was the excuse. And so they came out with a preemptive sort of strike and said that it's because of all this that the Americans are not welcoming the Russians into their country. When the truth of the matter was uh, the, the visa appointments have to be set way far in advance. You can't just process 32 people uh, within four weeks or whatever it was. And, you know, I never thought in my life in doing any events like this or doing what I do for a living that I would actually receive a letter from the the consulate in Moscow uh, that has my name in it, that's to Senator Grassley, because I, I quickly said, well, you know what, we're not going to let him get away with that. I'm going to try and do everything I can to get the Russians here. So I called Grassley's office and explained the situation. And they obviously, Senator Grassley is, is a big deal in D.C. And so he called and had the, um, what is his name, the minister uh, for cultural affairs or, or whatever at the, at the embassy there personally sent him a letter and called him and said, uh, can't do it. Uh, this is the reason why, et cetera, et cetera. And actually it's interesting at the bottom, it says, uh, it says due to, uh, also due to a recent conviction of a member of the Russian national wrestling team in court in, in actual Russian court for involvement in extremist activities and terrorism, of the Islamic State, any application from Russian wrestlers will go through additional scrutiny. So um, there were all sorts of problems, but in the in the international press, it was because we were unwelcoming, and that's disappointing and unfortunate. So uh, that's furthest from the case. I every comment I made is we want the Russians here, we want the Iranians here, we want to wrestle the best. So these sort of challenges come up. We work through them. We very quickly started looking at, okay, who's the next in line? Oh, they can't do it. They can't do it. France can't come. Italy can't come. Uh, Morocco can't come. And we started going down the list. Uh, India, they can make it. India's got the money. They've got the visas. They're going to come. Uh, then we started going down a little bit further. Mongolia. Mongolia's in. Mongolia will come. Mongolia... Then, but then you're four weeks out and you're like, how are you going to get 30 people on a plane from Chicago or Minneapolis or Detroit to Iowa City? I mean, you've been on these planes. There's maybe two or three seats left at, when there's four weeks out. So uh, Mongolia, we had to figure out. We flew them into Chicago. They have a, a, a Mongolian People's Society or, or Friendship Society in Chicago. Uh, they arranged for a bus. They landed in Chicago. They bust over. Uh, India arrived. India arrived uh, to the United States for the World Cup 24 hours before they had to wrestle Team USA in the opening round from India. And so I remember, and I'll show you a picture here of them at the airport. So this is our first country. This is Kazakhstan who arrived at the airport. Uh, some of them uh, when they when they arrived. This is Japan. Uh, this is some of them. They probably had a, about just as many people off the camera here. Uh, this is uh, Azerbaijan, uh, which is a terrific wrestling nation. Uh, actually, that one guy holding the flag there on the right is, uh, is a three-time world champion. Um, yeah, Azerbaijan is largely um, uh, Russians. I mean, a lot of Russian wrestlers that are there. Um, the other interesting thing with all these is I found two University of Iowa students for every country, and so we kind of assigned them to the delegation for the whole time they were here. If they need to know where to go get this, where to go get that, I told them, your job is just to, we're going to pay you to just be their friend. And they loved it. They're from this country. They're, they just thought it was the greatest thing. Every time they entered the arena, I had that ambassador carry that nation's flag and lead the team in. We asked each country, what do you want your walkout song to be? And they're like, what does that mean? And I'm like, when we walk into the arena, we're going to have flags and it's going to look like you're walking into your arena. So what do you want your song to be? So they all, like all the wrestlers had fun picking out like what, their nation's song would be. Uh, so a lot, a lot of uh, interesting fun there. This was uh, Georgia. They had one of the smaller delegations, uh, uh, but really good wrestlers, great wrestling nation. Uh, this is Cuba. I've got a funny story about Cuba later, but Cuba uh, was a little hard to get here, uh, but we ended up figuring it out and getting Cuba here. 
This is uh, India, which uh, they arrived at 11.30 p.m. on um, on uh, Thursday night, and they wrestled Team USA at, uh, at 8 a.m. on Saturday morning. And Team USA was by far the best team. Uh, and so they didn't win a match uh, against uh, Team USA, but it's unfortunate. Uh, Mongolia, uh, when they arrived at the hotel... And this is Team USA when we won the uh, um, the whole World Cup. Uh, at the end, you can see President Harold there and, and Dan Gable and uh, uh, some of our two ambassadors, the two kids. Actually, for Team USA, I picked two kids. I, I found a story about this one kid over in Council Bluffs that's um, really, really good seven-year-old wrestler who's been uh, battling leukemia for two or three years. So I had him come over and basically hang with the team for three days and put him in a hotel and he's that little kid that's holding the flag there so he absolutely loved it so cuba just a real quick story there on them is um uh, i gotten to know them a little bit because i i lived in cuba and i but nowhere near havana um but i did go to havana last year as a guest of usa wrestling for a tournament um i was one of the usa wrestling coaches although i just kind of carried water and walked around um, but I went over there and I just love Spanish culture and I love Cuba and I, I grew up in Puerto Rico. I love Puerto Rico. Um, and so I got to know these guys pretty well. And, and the one guy there in the red with the jeans, he actually just won a world gold medal, uh, two days ago in, in, um, in Budapest. But these guys showed up and, and I pick them up at the hotel and, and I'm kind of personally taking care of these guys just cause I really uh, fell in love with them at uh, some of my other staff with some of the other countries. So I show up at the hotel and I'm like, Hey, uh, we're ready to go. We got the bus out front. And they're like, Oh, Mr. Josh, uh, ultra out the bus. We need another bus, another bus. And I'm like, no, 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 you don't need another bus. It's the same number of people. We're going to the airport. No big deal. Uh, you're all going to fit. No problem. He goes, no, we, uh, we have uh, television. And I'm like, Oh, it's, it's no big deal. We'll get your television. And I look over and there's like one television sitting by their bags in a box. And I'm like, no problem. They go, no, 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 no. And they had me look over there. They had four of these carts. They had went to Walmart and Best Buy and they had bought 16 TVs. They had bought bicycles, strollers. I mean, basically the whole community got together and you can't get these things in, in Cuba. I mean, I went to Havana. You, you, we can't do, we, we can't trade. We can't do anything. I, I had to take $3,000 worth of cash on the plane with me and we don't, you don't do anything like that. So I'm like, Oh my God, are you kidding me? And so I go, Hey, I'm Michael, we need another bus. <laughs> so we get to the airport and I'm like, I look at that gate agent and I'm like, I am sorry <laughs> for what's about to happen to you. And so they like all paid like $150 for each oversized box and bag to get on this plane. And there was one TV left that was too big. It was like a 70 inch and it was by the guy who won the gold medal. And he's like, uh, Josh, uh, I, I can't, do you want to buy a TV? I'm like, no, I don't want to buy a TV. And, you know, I looked at, I go, do you have a receipt? And he goes, yeah. And he I looked at, he's like $1,400 for this TV. And I'm like, where did you buy it? And he goes, uh, Walmart. And I said, okay, Walmart, Walmart, Walmart. And I was like, there's a Walmart in Cedar Rapids over there by that west side. I'm like, I look at my watch. I go, all right, let's go run. So we grabbed the TV. We got out in the van. I went to Walmart. I ran up there. I cut the line of all the people in line. I said, I'm sorry. This is a Cuban. I got to get him back to Cuba. We need a refund. <laughs> and so the guy was really cool. And he peeled off 14, $100 bills. The Cuban gave me a big kiss on the cheek. We ran back to the airport and he got on his plane and made it with it with his cash. So it was, it was really good. Um, so that's World Cup wrestling. I'm happy to answer questions. I want to leave time. But um, the other sport that's that's a really big deal that's grown up a lot is this jingle cross. You know, uh, in Europe, cycling uh, is as big as soccer uh, for the biggest sports in Europe. And cycling, by and large, has three disciplines. Uh, the UCI is the governing body for the sport of cycling. Uh, they're headquartered in uh, Igle, Switzerland, which is right off of Lake Geneva uh, uh, by a town called Montreal. It's interesting. All the sports are there. Uh, the UWW of wrestling is in Vevey, Switzerland, which is one train stop about six kilometers from each other. The governing sport of cycling, the governing sport of wrestling uh, there on Lake Geneva. And it's because the USOC is, is headquartered there in uh, Lucerne, Switzerland. And so <clears throat> Jingle Cross and UCI 
has cycling, road cycling, like you see with the Tour de France. They have mountain bike cycling, and then they have this sport of cyclocross, which is what's been happening here since 2005. There's a doctor named John Meehan who used to be here and went to medical school here and, and worked here up until about 2007, and he loves cycling, and he loves cyclocross. And so one day he went out in a field in 2005, and he set up some cones and flags for him and his friends, and they had a little cyclocross race. And then 16 years later, or I'm sorry, 13 years later, it had be grown into become the largest amateur cyclocross races in the United States with about 4,000 per participants. And they had kind of moved it from Coralville, where they originally had it, over to the Johnson County Fairgrounds. And so it had grown and grown and grown and grown and become this amateur cycling. And it was called Jingle Cross because it always happens in Jan uh, November and December when it's snow and crappy out. That's when cyclocross cyclocross season begins in September and, you know, runs till February, March. It's a winter sport. So you're, you're riding over obstacles. You're getting off your bike. You're picking it up. You're running through mud, all sorts of things. So, um, I had learned about this and we had become sponsors of it. And I went to John and I said, uh, Hey John, um, what do you think about going and getting the U S national championships? And he goes, let's go even bigger. Let's go for the world. I'm like, all right, well, what does that mean? <clears throat> John now lives in Seattle. He's one of the world's leading pediatric robotic surgeons. He works on the genie machine and he'll like repair intestines on a one and a half pound baby out of through a robot. Uh, that's what he does for a living. And he just comes back every year for two weeks for fun and does this with an army of volunteers. And since day one, he's given every dollar we've ever made from this event uh, to the children's hospital here in town. He doesn't take any money and just does it for fun, uh, which is amazing. I mean, what an asset we have for this community. So he kind of grew this sport. Uh, it used to be in the winter. There's some people riding in the winter. There's some people running up what he called Mount Crumpet. Uh, rather than in the UCI, when you see the Tour de France, they have podium girls when you win. So the two beautiful women in the dresses give the rider a kiss. John doesn't do that. He gets a couple kids from the children's hospital to come over here, and they're the podium kids. Uh, he gets teddy bear races, teddy, uh, the uh, stuff build a bear to all the kids in the kids races. It's just a different atmosphere, a different experience, uh, and obviously the community has embraced it and loves it. So in 2013, we went over. Um, Tom Marcus, who used to be the city manager, and I, I flew Tom Marcus, myself, and John, and we flew over to Kochside, Belgium, to see what a World Cup race looks like. So every year they have a World Cup season. So they have eight cities in the United States. Or no, it's eight cities in the world that are the World Cup season. So the biggest events of the world. It's like eight playoff games for, the, for baseball. And then at the end, there's a one race that determines the world champion for the sport. It's a very, very big deal. There's 60 to 80,000 people at these races in, in Europe. This Kolkside, uh, Belgium is on the French Belgian border. We flew into Brussels three days after the Paris attacks. The second day they were there, they shut down all public transportation and started bringing tanks in the streets. Because I don't know if you remember, they were searching for those guys just in Brussels. My wife was freaking out. Uh, get back on a plane. And so we left Brussels and we went and stayed in Bruges, Belgium, which is an incredible town. And we went to this and we showed up and said, hey, we're from Iowa, and here's our bid to host a World Cup. And they were like, what the heck? What are you doing here? But, you know, we knew, to, we, knew we needed to make a statement. And that 5000 bucks or whatever we spent for three of us to go there for four days and see this race and show firsthand our, how serious our commitment was and put this bid together that was over the top, something they'd never seen, we got the World Cup. And we had proven we can do it, and now we've had it three years in a row. This past year, we were voted by all of UCI, by all the riders, the best World Cup in the world. We received this huge trophy in uh, Igles, Switzerland, and they've, uh, they left all their stuff here. They want me to host again, and they said, if you don't host, we'll pay to have you ship it back to Switzerland, but we really want you to host. <laughs> so uh, we'll figure that out. That's uh, to be determined later. But this is uh, Kochside, Belgium uh, races. Uh, these are some of the images from around here. Um, uh, at our race, and it's just become a huge deal. This is uh, some shirts we put together. I have a couple of them here. Uh, you can determine how you give them out, but these are some of the more popular shirts. Um, these are all the cities in the world that are currently hosting, and this year we were second. So the first year we hosted a World Cup, there was only one other in North America, and that was Las Vegas. So it was Las Vegas, Iowa City, and then it went to France, Belgium. 
when I was there this past year to receive the bid, because we all the cities have to go to accept the bid from the commission, uh, I'm standing in a line with Denmark, Belgium, Germany, France, and Iowa City, <laughs> right, here, right here. So it's crazy. And that Waterloo is actually Waterloo, Wisconsin, not Iowa, because Waterloo, Wisconsin is the home of Trek and Trek Cycling, which is a $900 million company, and they can afford to have a World Cup. So um, all these cities, uh, you know, it ends uh, this year in Hoogerheide, uh, in May. That was actually last year, uh, a World Cup. So this year it ends in, uh, oh, Hoogerheide again, yeah. And they just finished Bern in Bern, Switzerland this past week. So these are just some of the images, just beautiful images of the sport. It's such a romantic sport. It really is. I, I went to the World Championships as a guest of UCI uh, in um, Valkenburg this past uh, January, and the snow was falling, and it's just a, incredible. There was probably 80, 100,000 people at this race. Uh, this is an American, Katie Compton, who actually won the first World Cup here as a woman. The women's races are really the only area that – we're competitive in uh, the men we we don't have I mean we get destroyed by Belgium and Germany but the women we have some incredible women uh, races or uh, cyclocross riders they love the mud uh, I'm a big cyclist this is the world champion from Belgium I mean the world champion is here the best in the, right and just fell in love with Iowa last year I took him to the football game uh, he wanted to go he, they showed up his whole team they had went and bought Iowa Hawkeye stuff I said, what, where did you get all this stuff? And they, they bought, he's wearing, he actually bought a women's jersey. He was wearing a ladies football jersey. I'm like, looks a little tight, but you're a small guy, so let's make it work. Took him on the field. Uh, it, was, it was incredible. His name is Wout Venner. He's from uh, Belgium. This is the double flyover, which is out there. You'll see a lot of Flanders flags. That's a Flemish flag there by the United States. This is coming down Mount Crumpet uh, with some of the riders. In the crowd, we had probably 10,000 people out there watching. Uh, another d descent. Uh, this gentleman is from uh, the Netherlands. This is the singular speedo race. So, as part of Jingle Cross, because it was always in the winter, they let people. They tell All right, who's crazy enough to go get a speedo arn and race, do a, ra a lap in a speedo in December. So they kind of carried on this tradition. And this is the UCI timing clock. They tested, they have to do this for real, the real race and the finish line to determine whether or not your wheel is this far ahead of this wheel. So during the race, they thought it was funny to take a picture of these people on the timing clock and they broadcast it all over the world that this is Iowa, this is Iowa City uh, doing the speedo race. Uh, this is our entire team on the podium afterwards. So, you know, they, uh, there's some other ones I won't get into here, but uh, we went to Valkenburg because they want us to host the world championships. They've been asking us uh, quite a bit whether or not we would do this. I'm, I'm hesitant to do it because it's at the end of January, and I just don't think we can deliver a crowd like you can in Europe at the end of January uh, here in Iowa. And unlike Trek, who has $900 million, I need to sell beer. I need to sell tickets. And uh, we're not, people aren't going to drink a lot of beer at the fairgrounds when it's 20 below in, uh, in January. So... I'll leave it with that. There's more I can get into, and, and uh, that way I've got one minute. You've got 16 minutes to, for the uh, Q&A, if that works. Uh, what are the plans, both international and national, for the arena being built in Coralville? Yeah, so the arena in Coralville is really providing us with a whole other level of opportunity, particularly in the sport of wrestling. Uh, wrestling at the international level is freestyle and Greco, not folk style like you see here at the University of Iowa. And the freestyle and wrestling, or freestyle and Greco wrestling seasons run from April to now to September, October ish. We've never been able to host those events. The only reason we host the World Cup and Olympic trials is because they're in early April and it's in Carver Hawkeye Arena. And the reason we have it is because Carver Hawkeye Arena is not air conditioned. And you cannot host a wrestling event of any kind. You can't really host an event in there in the summer uh, without people, you know, they're having a lot of problems with the heat. And so uh, this, uh, this actual venue uh, will enable this community to host any international wrestling tournament in the world that exists today, uh, which they really want to come here. So UWW Junior Worlds, lots of activities will be able to go there uh, in addition to some other sports. So we're very excited to have that as a new asset for what we do. 
is the trail being finished around Seoul and that extends to Cedar Rapids likely to be considered for the Crandeck run? Uh, no, it will not because we, we can't get the distance there. Um, we tried to actually look at going through Solon, uh, but you cannot get 26.2 miles going that route to finish, uh, to go Cedar Rapids to Iowa City. So we'll always have to use 965. We also don't really like running our trails uh, unless we get the race spread out a little bit uh, because it it's, can be dangerous. So we'll have to always use 965 for a marathon. CBB question, how do apps uh, such as Airbnb offset the hotel motel tax collection and by extension funding for the CBB? So Airbnb was originally bad. I was like, no, Airbnbs are bad. Uh, but Airbnb actually worked with the state of Iowa. And so they collect uh, lodging tax as part of the collection they get from the homeowner. And then Airbnb as a company remits it to the state of Iowa. And that gets included as part of the quarterly uh, returns to the city. It's part of that collection that comes in. So uh, they take care of that as part of their fee that they pay uh, take out for the homeowner. Uh, what international sport are you going after next? Uh, anything other than wrestling or cycling? Possibly volleyball. Um, we have some opportunities with the new arena in Coralville. Uh, there's a, it, this, the arena will seat about 5,100. It'll have 5,100 fixed seats. For concerts, you can get about 7,000. That arena in Coralville is going to be the new home for University of Iowa women's volleyball. Uh, they'll start competing there in the fall of 21 and bond. And everybody's very excited about that because when you put 1,800, 2,000 people in a 5,000 seat arena, it's got a totally different feel and vibe than in a 16,000 seat carver. So they're excited. And next to the arena sits a 53,000 square foot field house. And so that space will have five to eight volleyball courts in addition to uh, volleyball in the arena. So there are some potential opportunities there. Uh, for that. Another sport that's unique you wouldn't think about, and maybe you wouldn't call it a sport, but it's actually coming next uh, June, is we are going to be home to the, um, the, the International professional, women, women Professional Disc Golfers Association. So the, there will be women here that are professional disc golf players from around the world. I was looking at the roster the other day from Estonia, all these places that will be here competing for a world title at the new um, fields over there in Coralville, um, forget the, Altmeyer, and then also Sugar Bottom. So who knew uh, professional disc golf? Not me. Uh, will all the events that you've been speaking about fill all the new hotels around here? <laughs> no. That is a big problem, and I've been trying to say that as loud as I can for months now, if not a year's. Uh, we are going to be having a very, very tough two, three, four next several years in the hotel market. Uh, the hotel market continues to do well. Uh, demand is up 3% year over year, which is about steady for the past 15 years. Uh, and that's good. Unfortunately, um, right now, supply is up 21.2%. And in the next 14 months, supply will be up 36%. So we have a 36% increase in hotel rooms and a 3% increase in demand, which is totally insane. Uh, and what that's resulting in is hotels panicking and cutting rate. It's great for consumers. It's terrible for collections and for the businesses. So it's, it's a ugly deal and I just don't get it. Here's our last question. Uh, please show us your other shirts and anything else you brought with you. I just have some of those shirts, but I did bring this and forgot to talk about this. Up until the Russians and Iranians created some problems for me uh, working on the World Cup and all of that, this was my biggest challenge for Carver Hawkeye Arena. This is known as a Vuvuzela, and these Vuvuzelas are commonplace for Iranians in uh, international events and other, other countries. But when I went to the World Championships in Las Vegas, uh, these are so annoying. I mean, they are 
a beautiful people and a beautiful f- fan base. And I loved every part of everybody that I enjoyed that were Iranians, but they sing and they play these nonstop at the top of their lungs. And it creates an envi- international environment like you've never seen. And I know these ha- they have these at soccer too, but I wouldn't even try to play it, but w- these are not permitted in Carver Hawk Arena. So we actually got special permission and Tom had to go upstairs and make sure they know that this is part of the sport and an international event. So Vuvuzelas were allowed. Uh, unfortunately, the Iranians did not come. We now conclude our program, and I want to thank uh, Josh uh, for spending his time and sharing uh, his uh, experiences on bringing the, the world of sports uh, here to Iowa City. So let's give him a big round of applause. Also, thank you to our sponsors, University of Iowa's International Programs, the U of I Honors Program, the U of I Public Policy Center, and the Stanley UI Foundation uh, for their generous financial support. And also today's special sponsors, Midwest One Bank, Taxus Plus, and Hazel Ziba. And also, of course, thanks to City Channel 4 for making our programs available for viewing audiences. And Josh, as a small token of our appreciation... We present you with the highly coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations mug. You can show this to your international guests. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>